inviting me uh, to speak this evening, <coughs> and I uh, would uh, be remiss if I did not first extend a, a thank you to your club for the assistance that you provided the Emergency Communications Center when we had the recent uh, outage uh, that Larry was talking about. Um, CenturyLink had a, had a major cut in the construction area up near Rio Road. Um, they, uh, it's one of those where they come back to market and then market and then market again and still cut and cut right through uh, all of there. And it actually affected all the way up into northern Virginia. So it was not just a local um, um, uh, problem, but it was uh, all the way in uh, Warren County actually was affected uh, very uh, heavily um, in that area and with their emergency services um, and their 911 center. So it was, uh, it was a big issue, but it's obviously an issue for us in northern Albemarle, and so we certainly appreciate um, how quickly you guys responded, uh, Mike McPherson and, and his folks that helped us man uh, the various different uh, um, fire stations and uh, uh, basically was our lifeline to the community uh, until they were able to, to uh, get it repaired. And um, I understand that uh, they're still trying to figure out how uh, something that was um, supposedly marked so well uh, cause such a major problem for the area, but um, that's actually happened three times now in Albemarle County in the last year. Uh, two times on, um, on the Route 29 South, and in that case it was a major, both cases it was the exact same location, it was a major uh, uh, fiber optic pedestal that got hit by a vehicle uh, that went off, good ways off the road and hit it, and then, so they decided to bury that. <laughs> so, so, so it's now underground. So anyway, but we do appreciate the help that you provided, and certainly consider you guys part of our organization. So we appreciate the, uh, the assistance. Yes, sir. I woke up that morning and had no internet, no DSL, and I didn't have a dial tone. I don't get cell phone coverage at my house, so I drove out to Holly Mead, and when I got all century link, they said. Yeah, there's an outage, but there's less than 50 people on that. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, they probably yeah, believed that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we found out it was obviously a whole lot more than that. Um, and uh, mostly the northwestern part of the county, and then to Green, and then, like I say, it, it went all the way into northern Virginia. So, it's a major issue. So, anyway, thank you guys for your assistance with that. This evening, I'd, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the Emergency Communications Center and, um, that. Um, encompasses the city, county, and university. So um, I've got some uh, slides and then certainly uh, uh, a couple of other things at the end and then we'll entertain any questions that you guys might have to try to give you a little bit of an understanding about uh, not only what we do, how we do, but also uh, how our operation actually works from the point of hiring an employee and coming into the, uh, into the operation. So if we get into that. Uh, A little bit of history. Um, the uh, ECC was actually formed in January of 1984 and it was originally called the Joint Dispatch Center and the reason for this was because in uh, about 82 uh, the city and county both decided to put in a 911 system and initially they they started uh, separately and they were going to put in they realized they were putting in two 911 systems and someone had the foresight to say hey why don't we do this together, and uh, and why don't we uh, you know save some money and let's do a joint system, and so that's that's how this actually started. So originally in 1984, when the Joint Dispatch Center, it was just law enforcement, and basically they each of the three police departments had their own dispatch center. They had their own ten-digit telephone emergency telephone number, and so what they did is when they formulated 911, originally it went to uh, consolidating those three centers into one. The original facility was in the basement of the city police department in what was an old gun range. Um, and uh, it was a shooting range for the police department that was underground under the uh, city hall. And that's where the original communication center was. In March of 1989, they entered into an operational agreement with the three volunteer rescue squads, cars and wars in Scottsville, and uh, the center then started dispatching the, um, uh, the EMS agencies, which were all volunteer in the city and the county. And so they had law enforcement and uh, EMS dispatching. And uh, they, uh, 
they incorporated that, and then in 1990, they uh, hired their first emergency management coordinator full time. Um, and uh, now, when I say full time, it was a 20 hour a week position between three jurisdictions. And uh, the very first emergency management coordinator was a guy by the name of Wayne Campagno, who later became the 911 director and was handling emergency management. Shortly thereafter, uh, I'm sure many of you all know Kay Harden. Uh, Kay was uh, hired um, uh, and was a retired uh, lieutenant colonel with the uh, U.S. Air Force. And um, Kay came on board and served as the emergency management coordinator for the city, county, and university until 2005 uh, when he retired. So that's how emergency management became involved. And each time it was the city, county, and university looking at, well, we can each hire one each or we can work together and, and have, do a regional uh, operation. So when Kay was hired, one of the first things that he did <coughs> was draft, uh, write and draft a regional operations plan, emergency operations plan for three jurisdictions. It's the first time that it had ever been done in the Commonwealth. So the first regional emergency operation plan in the Commonwealth of Virginia was actually here in the Charlottesville area. And Kay Harden was the person that uh, actually uh, wrote that plan. In 1990, uh, or in 19, or 2007, actually, we brought fire rescue or fire dispatch into our operation. So what used to happen is we would take all the 911 calls for city, county, and university, and if it was a fire call, we immediately had to transfer it back out of the 911 center to fire dispatch, which was up on Ridge Street in the city. And the city fire department then would dispatch the county fire calls or the city fire calls. And so in 2007, uh, we uh, worked with the city and um, brought first the county operation in, and then a few months later brought the city operation in. So today we have all of public safety in one facility uh, under one roof, and uh, we have since consolidated dispatch for the EMS and both fire departments into a single dispatch. So. Today, when we dispatch out a fire call, city, county, uh, EMS are all on the same frequencies. City hears everything, county hears everything, because they all work very closely together. And so instead of having a county dispatch and a city dispatch and an EMS dispatch, it's all done with a single dispatch system now. And then what we do is we hand off those calls through our radio system to TAC operators who then take over the calls and work with the responding units. And, um, handle the call with the responding units. These are our public safety partners, um, and basically it's all the law enforcement agencies, and then the fire agencies and rescue agencies within Albemarle County, the city, and the university. We also work very closely with both sheriff's departments. However, we do not dispatch them on a daily basis. Both, both of the sheriff's departments do mostly civil process and the courts, and so when they're out after hours, after 5 o'clock, if they're, uh, people are out or if they're on special operations, then they will come up on our frequencies and we will dispatch them and talk with them and make sure that they're safe. So if they have anything, any emergencies or whatever, but they're not part of our normal dispatch operations because they really don't do the normal daily police operations like the police departments do. But we work very closely with those sheriffs. The, um, the communication center is managed by a management board. It's a 10-person board that represents the city, county, and university. And this is the makeup of the board. And it's, the, as you can see, the city manager, the county executive, the executive vice president of the University of uh, Virginia, the Elmer County police chief, city police chief, university police chief, both fire chiefs, someone that represents the volunteer organizations, and then one additional person that represents the university. So basically, each of the three jurisdictions have three votes. And then the tenth person, which is the, the volunteer uh, person, is the, I guess, I don't want to say the odd man out, but is, is the fourth vote that could go either way. Now, I will tell you this. I've been here 20 years. I've worked for this board for 20 years. and. I, I, they work excellent together. Um, I've, I've never seen an issue yet that they don't 
tackle as a, uh, when it comes to public safety, this group uh, looks out for the public. They do a great job. I enjoy working for them. People say, how do you work for 10 different bosses? It's not hard. It's not hard. It's just communications and, and uh, making sure that they know what's going on. But uh, anyhow, this is the management group of the, um, of the uh, ECC. They meet four times a year, so every quarter. And uh, the board chairman uh, is, uh, is rotated. The chairmanship is actually rotated between, between the three executives. So every May, they elect new officers. And so right now, the, uh, the, uh, the county executive is the chairman of the board. So next year, he'll rotate off. The city manager will become the executive on the board. And I work closely with whoever the um, executive is or the chairperson of the board. And then uh, the third person serves as a secretary uh, on the board. Um, and uh, basically, they're responsible for hiring me. Uh, I work directly for them. I do not work for the board of supervisors or the city council. I work for these folks. And uh, basically, my job is to work with the board chairman and develop all the policies, procedures, and operational uh, criteria for the, um, for the ECC. I, my job is to hire and fire staff, you know. And I like hiring staff. I don't like that other part. So we don't do that very often. Uh, but uh, uh, the bottom line is my job is also the budget. I will tell you that the budget that will be adopted um, tomorrow night, actually, the new budget will be adopted tomorrow night by the county, uh, is $5.5 uh, $5 million. About a million dollars of that budget goes toward the radio system and its maintenance of the radio system. And we'll talk a little more about that in a few minutes. But um, the, um, um, uh, also, uh, to talk a little bit about the budget, it's based on the number of calls dispa actually dispatched for the jurisdictions. So the biggest user of our system is obviously Albemarle County. And uh, it's about 49.5% um, of the system. So they're the biggest payer into the system, followed by the city of Charlottesville, then University of Virginia, and then we also receive about $600,000 a year from the state, uh, which is basically money that you pay on your cellular telephone bill for service monthly. It's 75% cent charge, which comes back proportionately to all the jurisdictions for operations of a 911 center. Um, so we, ours is a little over $600,000 a year. This is just an org chart. Of the, of the ECC to just basically show you um, uh, what we look like. The emergency management falls under the executive director. Uh, that was a decision that was made by the board many, many years ago before me. Um, and uh, the thing that has been very helpful, I know many of you all know Kirby and Allison, is that I had an emergency management background. So um, I work very well with those ladies and uh, actually cover for them when they're out of town. So it uh, gives them an additional level of cover uh, when, uh, when they need it. A little bit about our staffing. We have 54 staff positions. 39 of those are full-time communications officers, the folks that actually take and dispatch the calls. Um, we have some part-time staff. Usually those are folks that have gone through our training program and have moved on to something else but they still like doing this job, so they work for us as an as-needed basis. Um, and then uh, we have our own IT staff. Many of you guys know Gabe, um, I know, and uh, Gabe is one of our IT folks. He, he actually is our program systems manager, and, uh, um, and so they handle around the clock all of our technology needs. We have uh, administrative staff, and then the emergency management staff. Our employees, uh, on the communication side, which is the largest part of our operation, work 12-hour shifts, so they have rotating weekends off, so every other weekend they have Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off. I will tell you that with this job, like any public safety job, a lot of overtime, a lot of overtime, and ours is built basically on what's going on in the community. Um, as you all know, weather wreaks havoc on us, just like it does everyone else, and that drives our staffing up. And then also a UVA football game doesn't do a very bad job either. So, uh, uh, but um, uh, anyway, that's basically it. And then they work 12-hour uh, shifts. They have, we have two daylight platoons, two 
midnight platoons, and then we have two three to three power shifts. So we have people that come in in the middle of the day and work to the middle of the night to supplement the rest of the staff. The services that we provide to the community, first and foremost, is 911 call answering. I mean, we take every 911 call to the city, county, and university, and then we dispatch out either law enforcement, we dispatch out fire dispatch or emergency medical services. Our, all of our employees are also trained in emergency medical dispatching. So they can give pre -arrival, medical pre-arrival instructions over the phone. Not every jurisdiction in Virginia does that. Only about 60% of the jurisdictions in this state today provide emergency medical dispatching. So we just happen to be one that has that training. Our folks are well trained at that, and they're all certified um, and do a great job. Uh, we actually are recognizing some of our folks tomorrow night. We, this is actually National Telecommunicators Week, and um, we're, we do our annual award ceremony during this week every year. And we've got two folks that are being recognized for life saves, where they gave um, um, <coughs> pre-arrival instructions to a lay person over the phone for CPR, where the person later, uh, with, they were revived and actually walked out of the hospital. Um, so two of our folks are being, and then we have three <coughs> that delivered babies over the phone. <laughs> and also uh, be uh, recognized tomorrow night along with some of our other folks. So uh, 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 it's something that's important to us. Uh, the, uh, as far as our emergency management side, obviously we do emergency planning for the um, city, county, and university. And we talked a little bit about the emergency operations plan. Just keeping that plan updated mm -hmm. is a full-time job. Um, and then we do training and exercises with all of our public safety partners. Um, and then another thing that we do is every three years we do a major drill with the airport. We work with the FAA and the airport to put on this drill, which will be again next year, and it's a full functional drill. And I don't know, I think you guys have been involved in that in the past. Um, the last one that, that they did, I actually have never been at the other end. So I intentionally went to the other end so I could actually see how they do this. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you, it was quite exciting just to stand and watch and uh, the whole operation and how they did it with this huge plane that they bring in that catches fire and, and everything that they do. So it's pretty pretty neat it's, and we, we work with them and do all that planning. And then the other thing is public awareness. Um, I know that since, well during calendar year um, 2015, uh, our emergency, assistant emergency management coordinator did, um, I think it was 28 public presentations um, during that 12-month period where she spoke to hundreds of people about public awareness and what you need to do to prepare yourself for a real emergency uh, in your community. So it's something that's part of what we do on an everyday basis. Um, to tell you how busy we are, um, last year we processed 280,000 telephone calls um, and 73% um, of our calls are actually wireless calls, um, and it seems to go up about a percentage point every year. Um, and I'm sure at some point it'll it'll level out a little bit. But uh, I can remember when it was about 50 percent, and um, this year it's 73 percent of everything we do is based on wireless telephones, which then creates more issues because, as you all know, the original 911 systems were built based on your address. And, uh, you know, we put your address in and we immediately were able to locate you. So now with, with uh, the newer technology that will be coming out in the next couple of years, which has various different names, um, and um, it depends on what vendor it is as to what name they want to create. But uh, one of the things we are doing is working with VITA through the state to put in a, uh, an ESINET system um, where that it will eventually tie all of the 911 centers together so that we can share information and also it will allow us to pass data back and forth um, and you to pass data to us so that if you take that picture or that video or whatever you'll have the ability to send it straight to the 911 center and then it will be up to us to decide where it goes within the public safety realm. So that's where we're headed with that type of um, um, uh, technology. Also, 
it won't be based so much on your address, it'll be based on your exact location. So uh, that technology is coming. Um, the other thing that we are going to be doing here very soon is uh, text to 911. Uh, we're in the process now of working with all of the major uh, cellular vendors and putting text to 911 in place and should have it in in the next couple of months. Couple so, of uh, like, like green. Sir? Green and orange, I believe, already have it. Yeah, I know Green County does. Uh, they do. What we, the reason we have been waiting is we were upgrading our equipment. We just put in a new 911 telephone system. And uh, the new system works better with the technology than our old one did. So we were waiting to get that installed. So it is now installed and operational. So we're mm -hmm. moving forward with that. Um, this past year, we dispatched 147,954 police, fire, and rescue calls. That's actually where we put boots on the ground. That's where we sent police, fire, and rescue on calls. So um, it's not anything where we may have done it and then it got canceled. This is actually where there were responses and they actually arrived on, on the scene. So we're considered a medium-sized emergency communication center in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So we stay fairly busy. We're not like the Fairfaxes or the Virginia Beaches or the Chesterfields, but uh, for a community this size, we, we stay fairly busy. To tell you a little bit about our hiring process, we go through a um, application process, pre-employment testing. We do family interviews, second interviews, they meet with me, and that's after they're recommended by the panel. Um, we do a complete background investigation, criminal history check, and then we make a contingent offer. If we make an offer, we immediately do a psychological exam, um, and then we do hearing, vision, and drug screening tests on all of our folks. The only thing we do not require, we do not require a polygraph test. Um, and the reason for that is they're not sworn like police officers are and firefighters are, so we don't require that. A lot of comp centers do but we do not. But we do a pretty thorough background check on our employees. And I'll tell you, it's a tough job. And we, you know, we lose about <coughs> one third of folks that we hire who just can't do the work. Um, they, they, it sounds good and it's a great job, but they get in there and they take that first call and that first emergency call happens to be <laughs> that screaming person who's telling you that their child just died or whatever it is, and then they sort of say, I don't think I can really do this. So occasionally that happens. So we lose about a third of our new hires. Um, so we know one in three um, are, are not going to make it. Um, the um, hiring process, again, we go through a one-year probationary status. It takes us a year to, to train an employee um, to where they're on their own. Um, and uh, because we have to do all these various different functions, it takes us uh, 12 weeks to just learn the call taking function. And basically that's how to take, a pub take and process a public safety call and put it into our system. Um, and that's learning all of the technology pieces too um, uh, that we deal with. And then we then break off into the various different components. So our folks are cross-trained. So today they may be dispatching Elmer County Police, tomorrow they're dispatching the fire department. The next day they may be on the university police, they may be call taking the next day. So we rotate them into the center and um, it keeps their skill levels up, but it takes a while to get through this process. It's about a 2,000 hour um, thing to get through every piece of this. Um, we are one of seven accredited, nationally accredited communication centers in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We hold an accreditation through um, an organization called CALEA, which is the Commission on Law Enforcement. Um, and um, we have to basically meet or exceed 218 national standards. Um, and in order to keep our accreditation, we have to reaccreditate every three years. So we just in 2015 uh, met our reaccreditation and we actually were able to meet what's called the gold standard, which is the highest level of accreditation. So each year, every, every three years, we've been able to um, increase our level of proficiency. And so it's something that our staff is very proud of and uh, something that we work hard to, to hold on to. Um, so um, uh, it's something that uh, we've been here. Are the other 
uh, comm centers that are in Virginia that hold uh, a national accreditation. And uh, we actually worked with two of them to help them be successful in the process. And then we talked about the emergency management office. Um, basically, we cover 736 square miles with our operation, population of 167,000 people, and that was from 2014, so it's probably a little higher than that now. Uh, basically, with emergency management, it's hazard and risk assessment. So, you know, in this area, as you guys know, it's normally either flooding, severe storms, hurricanes, or an occasional 30 inches of snow. <laughs> so, um, but um, those are our, most, most of our things are, are tied around the weather. Um, and, um, but it doesn't mean that we don't train for other, um, other types of emergency. But um, basically that's, that's what we try to focus on. And here we have regional partners that are very committed to working together, which is the city, county, and university. And I will, as I said earlier, they do an exceptional job. Uh, in working together uh, when they talk about public safety for the community. And then, basically, we talked about our regional operations plan, which basically establishes our organizational framework. Um, and again, it covers all hazards, all disasters. This does not um, supersede or replace the plans that each of those three jurisdictions have themselves. Um, they, you know, they, they have operational policies and procedures for emergencies that they deal with, but this is the level above that when we're all working together. And that's what this piece is. Uh, and it basically just supplements their procedures. The levels of emergency, I know you guys know this already, but basically a level one emergency to us um, is um, just a normal community emergency response, and we're using normal resources within our community. Level two, we've got something that's major, and it basically has interrupted our operations, and we probably need help from outside resources like the state. And then the level three are emergency conditions that are so widespread that uh, you know we we basically uh, need uh, major assistance uh, from outside, uh, and it's more than a daily, uh, a one day event, it could be a week or two weeks or three weeks or months. Um, and so that's basically our levels of emergencies. And then basically in asking folks uh, how to help yourself basically is what we're saying here. Making sure that you know what your area is, what your space is, and what your emergency resources are. And I know that if Kirby's ever spoken to you folks before, she talks about constantly making sure that you have your kit at home and making sure that you have at least three days of enough food and, and, and um, um, your medicines and resources and things that you can have to take care of you and your family during a, a real, what we consider a real emergency. And a real emergency to us would be something along the lines of what happened in, uh, with, during Katrina, where that it's such a major uh, event that it may take two or three or four days before um, help is able to get to you and you have to take care of yourself and your family. And so basically, that's what we, want, we, we mean when we say your space and available emergency resources. And then basically it's important to know, you know, plan ahead. Make sure you know how that uh, you're going to um, be able to receive messages, talk to your family. It's always good to have a plan of uh, outside the area, people that you can contact that, that, that have some uh, understanding of where you may be or where you may be going. Uh, and then also what decisions you have to make for yourself, you and your family. Um, and then the biggest thing is emergency contacts and how to contact them. And a good example would be this incident which was really compared to most things, a minor incident which we talked about earlier, which was the phones being out. But what a disruption that was for people. And it really when you think about it on a normal daily basis, that was pretty minor uh, compared to what happened in Katrina. You know? and. 
So, but still, it was a major disruption for a very short period of time. But we had folks that said, you know, I, I didn't know how to, I didn't know what to do, you know. And, and what we're asking people to do is go ahead and think ahead and think about if these types of things happen, what, how do I take care of myself? How do I take care of my family? What are the things that I need to do if it's all my burden? And so that's what we're, we're we constantly try to make people think about it is that we may not be able to get to you. Uh, within that first uh, bit of time, and so what is it that you can do? And um, how many of you have any of you had the CERT training? So you guys know, uh, based on that, what uh, uh, that's what that's what that's all based around is how to take care of yourself and your neighbors. Um, and um, so, if you haven't had that training, I'd suggest that maybe you jump into one of Kirby's classes. She has different levels of that now. Uh, depending on how much training you want to have, so, uh, but it is, it's, it's some really good training uh, for, our, um, for our community. <coughs> One last thing, and then I'll, I'll go over some questions. Uh, I talked to, to Jim earlier and a couple of folks about our uh, current radio system, and currently we have an 800 megahertz um, um, smart zone radio system. It's 20 channels. And the system was put in, um, uh, and it's a trunking system. It was put in in uh, 2005, and um, or actually turned on in 2005. Um, and the life of that system is about 10 years. So we're in the process now of starting to replace it. And uh, it basically, we're talking about a $20 million uh, uh, replacement of this system. Sorry. Fire trucks, all that, right? Yeah, it, well, it, it's actually more than that. What, what it does, it, it, it's the radio system for all the public safety for city, county, and university. But also, we have public service agencies that are also on our radio system. The transit buses, all the, all the cat buses are on our radio system. Um, the university buses that run throughout university grounds are all on our radio system. The buses that are with um, uh, both school systems. There's a, one of our radios in every one of those buses. Um, and the reason for that is in the event of a major emergency and we need transportation, we immediately use those resources in order to transport people if we have to. And so we have agreements with city transit, and with the university transit, and the school systems. So we allow them to operate on our radio system. So those are users. The Elmer County Service Authority, Ravana Water and Sewer, are also on our radio system. Um, so it's a much larger, it's about 2,800 radios. Right now, and our system is designed for about 5,000 uh, users. So right now, we've got about 2,800 users on the system, public safety and public service. So just to give you an idea of what the, what the system uh, works, we have basically there's two dozen agencies, um, both public safety and public service. and. Um, and then um, that system is built off of four RF sites. Uh, we have one which you guys are very familiar with. You've got equipment on the tower that we have at Buck's Elbow Mountain, uh, which is one of our uh, tower sites. And then we have one at Carter's Mountain, Fan Mountain, and Peter's Mountain. With this new system that we're going to be um, um, doing, we're going to add either one or two more RF sites to the system, which will give us a much better coverage than what we currently have. And specifically, we're focusing on the southern part of Elmore County in, in the Scottsville area along the river basin down there toward Howardsville and in, in the Schuyler. And so right now what we have is um, we have con what's called a conventional fill-in system down there. And basically what we did is we put four conventional frequencies um, down in that area. And we have two that are assigned for law enforcement, two that are for um, for the uh, fire service and EMS, and basically, if they're operating in that area, they can go to those frequencies. We actually have those tied back and patched into our regular system so that the dispatchers don't see anything different at all. They can talk directly on those conventional channels to folks that are operating in those low-lying areas. So that's what we're trying to focus on is, is not, it's time, number one, it's time to replace the system. Number two is to make the system <coughs> better than what it already is. So that's what we're going to be focusing on. We have a, a, a consultant that we've recently hired 
which is AECOM, if you're familiar with them, it's a company out of uh, Lynchburg, and they are, have already um, done all the uh, assessments uh, on all of our um, technology that we currently have, all of our tower sites, and basically we're um, going to be moving forward. An RFP will go out here fairly soon, um, probably, I'm guessing, about May to June, and then uh, we'll start the process of uh, procurement to replace the current system that we have. And then, like I say, I, uh, we're looking at adding one for sure, maybe two additional um, tower sites to increase our, uh, our uh, abilities. Um, again, Southern Almar is our focus, but we've got a couple of other spots that we're, that we're aware of too that we want to try to improve. And the technology is actually going to help us improve too. It's going to go to a full P25 system so, um, um, which will give us some flexibility with our neighbors. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the Fruvana County is putting in a new system right now, and we'll be able to, um, you know, do some connectivity with them. Even though we're going to be on um, 800 megahertz, and there'll be a trunking EHF system, um, we'll, we'll have some abilities to uh, to talk with those folks. So. Well, I'd be certainly glad to answer any questions that you may have. I think Steve Sauer spoke about the same system that's going to reduce response time. <laughs> that, that is, that's probably true. Yeah, yeah, because he's involved in that with us. So I'd be probably Yes, sir. I would like to say that this, this is a perfect opportunity for us to realize why Aries needs to be trained and you need to be part of the Aries team is because of the kind of system we're being plugged into when we're called out and we're activated, that this is what we're supplementing or, or replacing in some in certain some cases. Yeah. So we do need to have a, a higher level, tra level of training and be part of that program so that we are able to plug directly into this system. So I hope it opens your eyes. Yes, sir. You know, will this system being replaced, will it be upgraded into a, to a newer Motorola system, or do you know at this time? Well, I don't know at this point. Okay. It will be upgraded, okay. um, but I'm not sure whether, you know, we're going to do procurement. Okay. So, I will tell you this, 10 years ago, Motorola was the only player on the block. Mm -hmm. Today, there are others. Right. So, certainly, now, whether they're going to be interested or not, we'll, you know, we'll have to let it, let it play out and see. Okay. But uh, with P25, obviously, it opens it up more than with a um, with a um, analog system like we have today. Sure. Will this require? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, you talked about the future of uh, automatic location identification, but what, what can you do today for a cell phone call? Can you can you get location information? We do, and, and, and it's actually a whole lot better today than it was two years ago. But basically, it depends on the vendor. Um, but we either do one of two ways. It's either a GPS chip in your phone or triangulation. Um, and um, obviously, I vote for the GPS chip because those seem to, uh, to give us better, um, uh, better information. But basically, today, if you dial 911 um, and you're within our, our footprint uh, on a cell phone, what we get initially is the information of the tower site and the sector that your call comes off of. It's the very first thing the dispatcher will see on their screen. They can do the, the, um, the newest equipment that we have that we just installed, they can do a 15 second rebid. So every 15 seconds they can rebid and they can see where, you know, then it locates and pinpoints where your location is. Now, I don't want to leave you with that's going to work perfect every time because weather means a big difference. Whether you're in a building or not is a big difference. We get the X, Y coordinates, but we still don't get the Z coordinates today. So what we would probably be able to say is, well, I know he's in that building, but I don't know what floor he's on. Okay. Um, the law says that the, the vendors have to plot within 167 meters of where you're standing or where you're located. But I will tell you that the technology is pretty spot on. Um, you know, most of the time, we get really accurate information. Um, but obviously, it's important for us that if you do know your location and you can tell us, it's important that you, you know, let, it, let us know that. So it, again, it's a lot better than it was. Yes, sir. What is the sector? Well, the, the, the cell sectors are built two different ways. Usually, they're built 
with tri three different uh, sectors, or they do an omnidirectional cell cycle, so which just goes mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, it just depends on the vendor and where they're trying to point. And those are all done, when they do them along the borders of our county, they actually work with the, the whatever 911 centers are on both sides of the border, and we make decisions at that point of the one pointed toward you, you take that one, we'll take these two, you know, and then uh, we just basically work very closely with the eight counties that border us. And if we take a call that's in Augusta County, we immediately transfer that call to Augusta County. If we take a call that's a Blue Valley County call, same thing. They transfer back to us. So it just we work very closely with the with the localities. Yes, sir. Uh, what in term, what what can you do with VOIP calls? Wireless is one thing. VOIP is another. We take the uh, VOIP calls actually, and they come straight into our system. Um, I will tell you that it depends on the VoIP vendor, and basically what he's talking about is telephone calls through the internet. Um, if it's a static call, the call comes into us just like a regular telephone call. If it's a if it's not a stat a non-static call, and it's one where it depends on your vendor. There are certain vendors that are supposed to notify you that your call is not coming to the local center that it goes to actually a call center somewhere else and then they call us. There are some VoIP vendors that do that. There are some that they're supposed to notify you that if you go out of town and your users on your computer that you're supposed to notify them so that they can redirect your calls because otherwise you could be in Germany and dial 911 and it'd come into us mm -hmm. if you have your computer set up that way. And that has happened uh, where we've gotten calls from abroad where folks didn't work with their VoIP vendor, um, and the call came into us, and they're in another country. Um, so that does happen. But we do work with them, and we do identify those calls individually, like we do regular 911 calls, so that our dispatchers know what type of calls. So we get either a regular 911 call, which is off of the landline, we get a wireless 911 call, or we get a VoIP call, and our system can um, tell the dispatcher which ones those are. You had a question. Rick asked my question. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So, Jim. Yep, great. Will it require a physical replacement of every police radio? No, we we don't we don't handle that part. We only handle the infrastructure. So what I'm talking about when I say an upgrade is anything at a tower site and anything at the ECC facility. Anything that's in a police car or an officer may carry on their person is handled by those jurisdictions. Um, Will it be compatible? And they should be. P25, they should be compatible. Yeah. Yes, sir. I have listened to many, many, many talks over the years here in this club and other clubs around the nation. I want to compliment you. I have not heard anyone explain things as well as completely with a good voice to listen to. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, do y'all have any plans or any discussions of, of like a 700 megahertz or any of the nationwide pooling frequencies well, or any of that stuff? We, we our, our system and that we have today is so them. robust that we're only, we're, we're not even using 50% of the system right now. So as far as frequencies, I think we're in pretty good shape. However, one of the things that is that is coming from the federal side is a thing called FirstNet. And basically FirstNet is taking 700 frequencies for public safety and then bringing data into public safety. So like broadband, basically, yeah. for public safety. So that is coming. There's about $7 billion that has been set aside by the federal government. That, and they're, they're basically, they've got two states right now that they're doing some testing in. Um, and uh, Virginia is not one of the two, but we are working with them through the state to um, make sure that you know we we're involved with that. It's just a long process because it's something you know. Basically, where that money came from is the FCC sold off right. all those frequencies, and that billions of dollars was set aside to do this public safety broadband. Yes, sir. 
So from a uh, practical perspective with an emergency versus non-emergency call, I know in Rockbridge County, I've called the non-emergency dispatch line and they said 911. I said, oh, I'm so sorry, I meant to call the non-emergency line. Uh, they're like, oh, no, no, you're right, you're right. That was, this was the non-emergency line. Is there a difference in Shotsville, Albemarle between looking up the non-emergency dispatch line and calling 911? It's the same people that answer the call, okay? okay? The difference is this, when we're really busy, we're gonna answer the 911 calls first. Okay. Um, that's, that's really the difference. Is there one unified non-emergency number? There is. Um, it's actually 977-9041. Um, and then, uh, you know, it just rolls into our system automatically. Yes, sir. There was a conflict in the law a few years ago, coming back to your uh, GPS identifying on mobile phones. Right. There was a problem in the law about whether the GPS could actually be given if the user hasn't enabled the chip or the, or the uh, given the permission to grant the location. Where's that stand? Do you know? And I, honestly, I, I don't know. I do know that with 911, it... Does it override? It overrides it. So you will yeah. get it. Yeah, we do get it. But now, and I remember when phones originally, when they first did the first phones, I think you could turn that function off. Yeah, you but still I, could up to about three, two to three years yeah, ago. Yeah, but I think now that you no longer, the phones allow you to do that. It, it's, it's automatically built into your phone. Okay, that's what my yeah. question was. Yeah. So don't buy a new phone. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on whether you want us to buy a new phone. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. So when the CenturyLink cable was cut, uh, what were the most severe impact on you that you could not handle with your 800 radio bed? It did not affect our radio system at all. Okay. There was no effect in that, and it did not affect the 911 system. What it affected was the user, you at your homes, mm -hmm. and the businesses out there. That's who was really affected. So if you had an emergency at your home, our system was working fine. It's just that when you picked up your phone, if you had no dial tone, you had no one to call. So I would have to drive to the fire department. And call yeah, or maybe to a neighbor who may have cell service. And it did knock out cell service for two of the major vendors. AT&T and Verizon, both in that area, got knocked out. Mm -hmm. If you had any of the other phones, <coughs> those phones worked. Well. Yeah, but, uh, but AT&T yeah. and, yeah. You didn't have backup cards. Right? And, and the reason being is AT&T and Verizon both work off of the, the CenturyLink uh, fiber optic in this area. Yes. Okay. Can, can you comment a little bit? Do you have any special interaction with the major uh, utility providers? What I mean by that is like Dominion, the gas companies, yeah, we CXX. Uh, we work very closely with them. Really? And we're actually working closer with CSX now because right. um, the big issue is, is that Almar County happens to be one of the counties where the trains that have the uh, oil that is distributed to, I guess, Chesapeake, Norfolk, that area down there. Um, and um, so we're, we've been working through our fire service, through our emergency management office to, uh, and I know that there's a regional grant that was just um, procured to do more training with fire and rescue with the rail system um, in the event that we would have one of those types of spills or fires like you guys have seen. But Southern Albemarle is where they come through. So like they come through the Howardsville, Scottsville, that area through that, that route is the one that they do. Um, and so we're working very closely with those folks. We work, we have a really good relationship with Dominion um, and we have a good relationship. What kind of information do you guys want from them? Just give us some Well, insight. the biggest thing that we try to do is, with them is we feed to them mm -hmm. information that we're getting and then they feed back to us where power outages are. Mm -hmm. um, and the bigger thing for us is they maintain the power to our tower sites. So we make sure that if we lose power at any of our sites, we work very closely with um, uh, them and they have us as a top priority to get the power back on. So, you know, as soon as we make a phone call to them, we go to the top of their list. Let's um, limit it to maybe one more question because we okay. still have a one more. Yes, sir. You know, as a manager, if I lost one third of my new hires, I would think I'm probably doing something wrong. Is there any way that you could identify, you know, the weak ones up front and reduce that? Well, there, I mean, we've tried a lot of stuff. I mean, it really has. And the, and the bottom line is, is, is that with everything that we've tried to do, 
until you get in there and do that job, you really don't know. But I'll tell you, I, 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 this wasn't gray when I started. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things we're going to be putting in place after July 1st is actually a new computerized testing system um, that has been designed specifically for 911 systems or for 911 centers to test people coming in. And so we're actually purchasing this system that is being used across the country to see if it will make a difference. Um, and we've heard pros and cons. I, I've heard some 911 directors say, hey, it's great, I'm getting a better quality of person. And I've heard others say, I haven't seen a change. You know, it just really depends on the individual. But we're going to give it a try and add it to our system, uh, to our testing system. So we'll still continue. We're just going to plug it in and basically once they get through that first level, we're going to have them take this test and basically it's, a, it's all done by computers. And um, yeah, we'll like, see how it does. Like a flight simulator? Yeah, very similar <laughs> type thing. But it's, it's, it's under the 911 microscope. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of sitting there with a headset on and, you know, uh, it, just, it just really depends. I mean, uh, I wish I knew the answer, but it's not, it's a nationwide issue. I mean, it really is. It's, it's a nationwide issue. Thank you all very much.